Uh, our next speaker is Bob Carr. He's a San Francisco bar pilot. You talk about a good job, huh? And he is going to tell you all about uh, himself and about what a bar pilot does as soon as he gets up here. Ladies and gentlemen, Bob Carr. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks. Appreciate it. Uh, good evening. Thanks for sticking around. Uh, I know we're the last one of the two of the weekend, and I had some technical difficulties getting going here. I don't usually give uh, presentations. This will be my first one uh, that I give a presentation to a group like this. Uh, most of my presentations are to high schools or to grade schools. Um, I am passionate about uh, teaching. Uh, the general public about a seagoing career, uh, so this is an extension of my passion. In addition to talking about myself uh, and what bar pilots do as I was introduced, we'll also talk about what it is that we can do to help avoid ship strikes, which are a serious issue for uh, whales. Uh, I'm a 1990 graduate of the United States Merchant Marine Academy, which is a federal academy in Kings Point, New York. And I, right out of school, I spent the next 20 years going to sea on an ocean-going uh, tankers. I worked for Chevron, uh, and I started out as an AB and worked my way on all the way up to uh, master, where I was captain for the last five years. I sailed uh, domestically within the U.S., and I've sailed internationally in the Mediterranean, West Africa, uh, South America, primarily. I got tired of uh, going to sea, wanted to try something different, so I had a midlife crisis. I took the exam for a bar pilot in 2010 and uh, started training as a pilot in 2011. Two year, two, a little bit over two years as an apprentice there, and I started as a full pilot in 2013. Uh, a lot of people ask or, or aren't aware of exactly what a bar pilot does. As a bar pilot, we're licensed by the state of California. You can pilot ships uh, with a federal license around the United States, but within San Francisco Bay, if you're going to be uh, a pilot, you need to have the uh, state pilotage. So what we do is we guide all vessels, 750 tons or greater, from sea into the bay. So that from sea means we board 11 miles off the coast, we're bringing them through the main ship channel, which bi uh, bisects the semicircular uh, hazards that are offshore, which is the Potato Patch Shoal and Four Fathom Bank. They bring them in underneath the Golden Gate Bridge to the nine ports within San Francisco Bay. San Francisco, Sacramento, Stockton, Richmond, Oakland, Martinez, Benicia. Um, you can also include uh, Monterey Bay is also a compulsory pilot to Jaria for our vessels that are 750 tons or more. What you'll see, uh, bar pilot, that our group on board uh, ship in, in Monterey Bay, primarily is uh, the cruise ships that you see. So, yes? Why are you a bar pilot and just a pilot? Uh, the term bar pilot originates from, well, they started the bar pilots in 1850, back in the day of sail. Uh, so what a bar pilot is, the, the offshore hazards are called the bar, like you would have a sand bar uh, somewhere at, off your beach. It's a similar principle. So we're called bar pilots, even though we're also, we do inland piloting as well. It's just one group, bar pilots uh, do it all, from the bar to inland. Thank you. What do we do once we get on board the ship? We are an advisor to the master. Uh, we get on board and we'll take the con. We'll do a master, what we call a master pilot exchange. We'll talk about the port that he's going to go to, which berth he's going to, what tugs we're going to use, what the tide is, what the currents are. Um, we'll also give him a brief overview of what the traffic expected along our route, and we'll review the route with him. And what does he provide to us? He provides to me uh, any ship characteristics that might be important, how long it takes to stop, how long it takes to turn. Uh, he'll also go over his draft, how deep he is in the water, what is the air draft. A lot of these most recent ships uh, coming into the Port of Oakland have air draft issues. They are getting the ships larger and larger, and they're taller and taller. So we need to be informed on what their air draft is so we don't scrape the bridges. Um, once that information exchange is complete and I've got navigational awareness, we'll go ahead and take the con of the vessel. The captain always retains command of the vessel. It's his vessel. It belongs to the shipping company that hired him. But we're there as, as an advisor for him. 
This is our operating area. San Francisco Bay, the entrance to, down in the lower corner is the San Francisco Sea Buoy. We'll board a ship at the San Francisco Sea Buoy. We'll bring it through where you see the magenta line. That's the main ship channel. And you can see the semicircular shape of the banks. And the main ship channel uh, is through, and it's a dredged, federally dredged channel. Um, we'll bring it through and into, through the Golden Gate Bridge into the waters in, uh, inshore. Some of the areas I'll be talking about today and are of big concern to uh, people who are concerned about the whales, these are the approaches to San Francisco Bay. In the north, we have the northern lane. These are called traffic separation scheme. This is an IMO, International Maritime Organization, uh, dictated traffic separation scheme. These are established to uh, help corral the ships into a predictable pattern to increase vessel safety and also safety for the coastlines. So the northern traffic lane approach is in magenta. You can see the wide magenta up there. Um, that passes through Cordell Bank Marine Sanctuary and into the Gulf of the Farallons Sanctuary on its way to the, uh, where we would board the ship in the center of that circle. You also have from the west, the western approach comes in just below the Farallons. I know it's a hard picture to see. I tried to take a digital picture of a chart. But you can see the uh, Farallon Islands are in that triangle, uh, excuse me, square right in the center. So the western approach brings them in just south of the, the uh, very sensitive areas that uh, surround the Farallon Islands. And then the southern approach comes up through the Monterey Bay Ma Marine Sanctuary, National Marine Sanctuary, and that extends all the way down to the south just off of uh, Monterey Bay. So those are the offshore approaches to San Francisco Bay, and we'll be talking a little bit about uh, that area. So the next is what are ship strikes? What we're concerned about, what I'm giving a presentation about today is ship strikes of whales. When a ship contacts a whale, whether it is a fatality or just causes injury, it is considered a ship strike and is counted as such. Although mand mandatory reporting is not, uh, not in place for this coast right now, it is something that mariners do, is it, it report uh, that they've made contact, if they're aware of it, uh, made contact with a whale. And they may or may not know uh, that they've killed it at the time. Ship strikes have been identified by NOAA uh, to be the biggest threat right now, one of the biggest threats right now of the population recovery of the uh, humpback, the blue, the fin whales, which we worry about here, and then the right whales uh, down on the uh, coast of Florida and the east coast. So which whales are at risk? We've got the blue whales are at risk. They're on the endangered species list. Uh, they're the greatest concern to the uh, superintendents of the National Marine Sanctuaries in our area, uh, primarily because not only the number of ship strikes that there are, uh, it's the small population. Uh, it is a critical, they're in a critical state. Fin whales and humpback whales are also a concern in our area. They're also on the endangered species list. Gray whales are not on the endangered species, but because of their numbers, uh, they are more frequently the victim of a ship strike should it occur. So how many ship strikes do occur? There is a uh, joint work group of the Cordell Bank and Gulf of Farallons National Marine Sanctuary, uh, they put together a, a joint work group from individuals from uh, scientific background, conser conservation background, and shipping interest background to try and come up with solutions for uh, ship strikes. Their statistics that they stated over the 24-year period of 1988 to 2011 there were 20 confirmed fatal ship strikes. There were 10 additional ship strikes reported, but couldn't tell if it was a fatality. Uh, it's, they assume, and I think it's safe to assume, that they have, those strikes are also fatalities. And they estimate that actual ship strikes are 10 times greater. Uh, there's no way at this point to tell exactly how many have been struck. So if you take those numbers, you have 30, increase it by 10, it's a potential high of 300. And the math on that is about one to two a year with a potential of up to 12 a year. And for a species like the gray whale, 
it is uh, a concern, uh, excuse me, the blue whale, it is a concern uh, to have that number of strikes. And this is just up in our area of San Francisco Bay. There are strikes and there are concerns down in Southern California. Uh, I'm not, uh, I don't know a lot of what they're doing down there for mitigation. So what is the ship traffic within San Francisco Bay? The U.S. West Coast is one of the largest uh, ports traffic density wise in the, in, in the United States and in the world. Uh, our overall volume of vessels it would be uh, a lot less than you would see in China, uh, the amount of cargo moved, but we do have one of the higher densities, in, especially in our area of the world. So we have about 300, three, excuse me, 3,500 ships coming into San Francisco Bay. That means 7,000 transits through the National Marine Sanctuary. 3,500 inbound, 3,500 outbound. As you saw, saw in the map, the chart that I showed you earlier, the uh, areas you can't avoid going through a National Marine Sanctuary on approach to San Francisco Bay. So all those transits occur, and that's by vessels that are 300 tons or greater. Shipping is vital to the San Francisco Bay Area. They have about $1.2 billion daily uh, for the, the overall maritime contribution to the economy. It's about $35 billion annually for exports, $15 billion annually for imports, and tens of thousands of jobs are related to getting the ships in and out. What is being done right now to uh, reduce the number of ship strikes? In 2013, they modified the offshore traffic lanes. They extended the western traffic lane on recommendation of that uh, joint work group. Uh, they extended it out past the continental shelf. What it did before, the western, the traffic separation scheme again was established for the safety of vessels, life, and, uh, and property. It started right just a little offshore of the uh, southeast Farallons. They extended that lane out so that it now goes beyond the continental shelf. How is that important? It helps to give the, the ships a more predictable path. The ships are on that, that trajectory all the way. And as part of that, that extension was knowing that if they can get them into that path earlier on, they're away from the higher concentrations of whales around the Farallons. And doing so outside of the continental shelf was important that you can get them the vessels in that position and off and running. Just this past summer, uh, NOAA established a voluntary speed, speed reduction zone, which is in those traffic separation schemes you saw a picture of, and I've got it again coming up here shortly, you can see it. Uh, what they are asking ships to do is reduce to 10 knots. So this is something that again came out of that joint study. Uh, Part of the scientific uh, evidence shows that a slower the ship is going, the more opportunity that whale has to evade, and it also uh, has less of an impact. As you would imagine with two cars colliding, you would have less of an impact if you're going slower. So it's the same principle. Um, it's right now a voluntary reduction, and it's, not, it's only based on the peak period of whale migration, which is May 1st through November 15th. There's the offshore zones again, highlighted to show the, uh, the zones. Question? Yes. How fast were the ships going prior to asking them to reduce their speed? The average ship speed of a container ship through these zones is about 18 knots. A tanker is uh, slower. They're running about 12 knots. Bulk ships are... Uh, running just about the speed of a tanker and possibly a little less. So they're running 10 to 12. And are you saying that one of these dot entries is more vulnerable than the other? Is the middle one for hitting whales? Or? Well, there's a couple of, I'm going to walk away from the mic if I can't reach everyone. Uh, let me know. There's a couple of things going on here. The uh, offshore, this zone right here, those are the parallel. exactly which year that uh, the state of California required 
uh, vessels to be running on a low sulfur diesel fuel when they're within 24 miles of the coast. When they did that, the ships weighed their options and instead of coming from LA and up through the southern lane, they actually rerouted to come through the western lane. Yes? Oh, okay. The, uh, uh, in, so increased traffic came through the western lane. Now it's a federal regulation and so it's not just state. So, and that includes all the waters and it goes out a little further. So the ships are starting to get back to a more natural pattern of using the southern lanes and northern lanes. So the western lane is not as critical as it was just uh, three years ago. Other things that are being done right now, uh, observations, real-time uh, real observations. There is a smartphone app called Whale Alert 2.0, which is really good for uh, the general public to use. They can log on uh, using their phone, say, I saw a whale, and that they can share that data with all the other users, and they can also see where other whale settings are. That is not really practical for us or for ships because we're not using our cell phone, for one, and the ships are usually outside of cell phone range. Um, but I'll explain that more on, on when we get to the specifics of what we do. Uh, how can the bar pilots help? Okay, so we, we do bring the ships from the sea buoy through the channel and underneath the Golden Gate Bridge. In that area, what do I see for whales? I do see whales frequently between Point Bonita and uh, Land's End, just offshore of San Francisco, all the way out to just about the entrance of the, of the uh, main ship channel. Where the water gets a little bit shallower in that way, in that area, not so many of the whale sightings in that area. It's only in the deeper water inshore and again the deeper water offshore. But they will be seen anywhere. Critical to have a proper lookout on the ship. It is required by international law to have a, a lookout. Uh, so these ships should have a proper lookout going on all the time and these uh, that's probably the single best manner to help prevent the ship strikes. When we get on board a ship and we talk to the, uh, the ship's master, we also tell the lookout, tell the ship's master to tell the lookout, um, keep an eye out for whales. It's not something that's their focus. They're looking at ships and small boats. Sailboats are a big concern for us, uh, but also to look out for the whales. And they can see uh, the whale spouts pretty relatively close in. It's, it's a little hard to see, and I've got a picture of how difficult it is a little bit later but uh, the proper lookout is, is critical. Observations. Okay, the ve vessel traffic surface in San Francisco Bay is pretty, it's one of the first vessel traffic services in the world and the first one in the United States, and they're pretty robust. What they will do for us, they require all commercial vessels to check in on uh, VHF channel 12 when they're offshore, and uh, the commercial vessels would include passenger vessels as well. And then there's, you can be a passive participant. In other, in other words, you're not checking in, you're not reporting, but you can listen in. Certainly, everyone can listen in. They will promulgate any whale sightings as well uh, for any ships that are checking in. And if we see anything, we would let them know on the radio so that they can pass it on to others. There's two sectors to the uh, VTS, and that helps. Again, it's San Francisco is, is more robust than most areas in the world. There's an offshore sector. Before a pilot even gets on board, these ships are checked into a system and VTS can share critical information for their transit in and out, which whale sightings is part of that. They'll let those uh, ships know as they transit the, the traffic separation scheme uh, where the whales have been sighted and to assist them in uh, having the information to make the critical decisions. Well, we can also we work inshore of the traffic lanes, so we're caught right at the very end of where the sanctuaries are and inbound. We're also looking to do speed reductions where it's practical. When it's night, that's, it's more of an issue when it's night because what we lose during the, uh, the nighttime, that's our ability to see them. So speed reduction is a more prudent action, especially uh, during the uh, nighttime hours. So we can reduce speed earlier on. We communicate as well, not only use the VTS system, but we're also on the VHF radio talking to other pilots. And we can also see other small boats in the area and relay information to them. 
our vantage point is pretty fantastic. We're typically 140 to 180 feet off the water. So we've got a really good high to eye to be able to observe a uh, great swath of the ocean. It's a, it is a good vantage point that smaller vessels may not have. Education. The, the pilot on board the ship is really one of the only interfaces face to face that the ship's crew will have uh, with someone local. Uh, the ship's agent may be involved and pretty much that's it. There's just a small group of, of interfaces that they have be able to pass along information. So we can take advantage of explaining them to the sensitivities of the national marine sanctuaries that they either just came through or will be going through on the way back out. Um, explain to them the importance of whales. If we're in that uh, peak migration period, uh, explain to them where the sightings have been. Um, relay that information from VTS. English is typically a second language for them. So we can, when we make that eye contact with the, the uh, bridge team, we can see if they understand. Whereas with VTS, they're on the other end of a radio. They may or may not be understanding, but we can see that and hopefully uh, follow through and making sure they do understand. I broaden beyond the bar pilots and the, whole, the ocean going uh, people in a whole. When I was talking to one of my longtime shipmates uh, from when I was working with Chevron, telling him I was going to give this presentation, he told me, he says, Bob, remember we love the sea. We love whales. We love all the sea life, you know, and we're inspired by it. We're, al we're always seeing sea life in, in all of its forms. When we're on the bridge of a ship, and I'll, this is what, when he made that comment, I recalled how it is. When we're on the bridge of the ship and the lookout says, whale, two points to starboard, I saw the blow. You know, he'll say that, and we'll all rush to the, uh, the windows, and we'll look out for the next one. You know, we love to see the tail flip. We love to watch it. You know, I always joked when I was captain, I joked with the crew that I charged them $50 for a whale watching tour. No, no one ever paid up, but uh, it was, uh, you know, we do enjoy it and we know how important it is. And you know, we can always avoid the whales if we can see them. There's a whale about a third of the way down the screen, almost in the half, a little bit over a mile away from the ship. And you can see that's about all we see. And that's what the lookout will report if he's paying attention. I try zooming in on it. And that's usually the best photo I have from 20 years at sea of seeing a whale. You can see it, but it's hard to snap that photo. talked also about avoidance and communication. Uh, I think mariners as a whole understand that as well. Uh, near the end of my presentation here, this is, uh, if you've got a QR reader, this is the study and there's the, uh, at the bottom is the website that I used. Uh, one of my colleagues was a technical consultant on this uh, study and was done uh, as a joint work group for both the Cordell Bank and the uh, Gulf of the Farallons was presented to the superintendents in 2012 and they are taking actions already that we've seen on uh, the results of their study. And not all the recommendations of the study have yet been implemented but they're working on it. That's the end of my presentation. Uh, kind of ran through it pretty quickly. If you have questions I uh, would like to answer them. Questions? Yes. The question, how, uh, what's the draft on the ships? They draw about uh, anywhere from 30 feet to 50 feet for the container ships coming into the Port of Oakland. Uh, ships that are coming into Richmond as an oil tanker or upriver to Martinez, into Richmond we'll see ships as deep as 45 feet. If they're going upriver, uh, up to Benicia or Martinez, about 37 to 38 feet. Going through San Pedro uh, Bay, it's um, excuse me, San Pablo Bay, there is Pinole Shoal, which is uh, limited, limits the drafts of the ships going up. And that's, that runs about 35 feet deep. So you can do 35 feet plus the tide, and we require it to have three feet under the keel at all times. Uh, which is not very much space. It isn't. It's one, yeah, one meter. Uh, 
Uh, I am not aware of any onboard technology that would help deter the whales uh, by emitting a sound that would tell them to go elsewhere. We do have uh, photometers that tell us the depth. I know those emit a sound. How the whales react to them, I'm not familiar. Uh, what's the worst experience? Uh, you know, I've got a, a video, if everyone, anyone's interested, I've got a video of uh, climbing a pilot ladder. Yeah. How are we on time? Ten minutes. Ten minutes? It's a, let me see what I got here. Uh, this was shot just recently by one of uh, my colleagues, and he's getting off the ship and onto the pilot boat. There isn't any real sound, so what you're hearing here is, is just a little bit of ambient from my computer. Pilot ladders are uh, supposed to be nine meters or less in length for the safety of the pilot. If it is longer than nine meters to get to the water, they are supposed to have a fixed ladder uh, to shorten that distance. So typically what you'll see is a fixed ladder at an angle on the side of a ship, and then the pilot ladder vertically from that. And the pilot ladder is a rope ladder the pilot boat is approaching. These are normal, kind of average seas uh, off of San Francisco. Obviously, this video is shot at night. The ship is in, it rides up and down on the swells. Before we leave the bridge of the ship, we'll ask the uh, helmsman to go ahead and go hard over on the rudder. He'll start the ship swinging. What that does helps create a smooth area of water uh, for us to get off on. It knocks down the swell, should knock down the wind if we have the ship angled correctly. Uh, and if it takes a long time for the transition to occur, that swell returns and then it becomes a little more difficult. What do you wear to keep warm? To keep warm and to float, I have a float coat. Uh, it's something you'll see on the waterfront. A lot of people would wear them. It's uh, got internal flotation on it. It's fairly warm. Uh, we also have an integrated uh, lifting strap, so if we need to be rescued by a helicopter, we can clip right into a strap. Um, we've got strobe lights. I have my VHF radio, and some of, it's not required, but some of the guys have a, uh, an EPIRB, a personal EPIRB. So if it gets wet, it gives a ping out to, uh, out to ships in the area. Pretty real, pretty real. Uh, what we'll what we'll do is you'll see there's a rope there as well. When you get you try to time it, he just slid down the rope. You try and time it so that as the boat is coming up, you just jump off and get clear of that area, uh, and then turn around and grab and grab the boat because sometimes it hits the side of the ship and it kind of knocks you backwards. You saw he actually braced himself off the side of the ship there. Uh, that's you know there are uh, there's some great video out there of worse conditions, uh, but I wanted to give something that was typical for us rather than the, and what the worst. Speed are you going to be this for us to get off uh, our our pilot boat operates best at ten knots for the transfer, so we run at about ten knots. So you have your own tug. Yes, it's not it's not technically a tug. Many people do call it a tug. Our, we have our own pilot boats. We have four boats in San Francisco, five actually. There's uh, three for the offshore, they're larger. We have one smaller but faster one that's run inside the bay if we need to do a transfer inside the bay. And we have an even smaller one uh, which is upriver stationed in Pittsburgh uh, for transits. We do a pilot, when we do a pilot change, I might bring the ship from sea all the way to Pittsburgh and then I'll get off and another pilot will come on and continue to bring the ship to the port of Stockton or Sacramento, which is another six hours further up uh, through those rivers. Thank you very much, Bob. Thank you.